Good evening, everybody. Good evening and a really warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Professor Sarah Barrow. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at UEA. It's my great pleasure to be introducing Professor Joanna Drugan. Joanna is Professor of Translation, Research Director and Coordinator within the School of Politics, Philosophy and Language and Communication Studies. Joanna's academic life began at Glasgow University with a Master's in French, then a PhD in French Environmental Movements. Jo's first academic post was at the University of Reading before she moved to the Department of French at Leeds University. At Leeds, she was a founder member of the Centre for Translation Studies and ran the MA Applied Translation Studies for over a decade. In 2008, Jo was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship and also became a Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Since joining UEA in 2012, Jo has taught specialist MA modules in translation technologies and professional translation an undergraduate module on translation and globalisation. Jo is proud, rightly so, to be part of the Migration Research Network within UEA's University of Sanctuary Group. Jo's overall focus is on professional translation and interpreting practice, but particular interests lie in translation quality, interpreting and translation ethics, user and client experiences and translation technologies. Her current research or her current research project, is on transnational organised crime and translation, a project which works with UK and Belgian police, the College of Policing and the Home Office to improve the quality of police investigations conducted across languages. Tonight, Joanna will explore the important link between translation and justice. What does the equation of language rights with human rights mean for communication in our increasingly multilingual societies? So please join me now in giving a warm, warm welcome to Professor Joanna Drugan to give her inaugural lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, thank you all for coming. Hello. Um, <coughs> sorry, I've got a bit of a call, so I'm going to try to project and I've got a mic. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to start tonight by acknowledging that when I was asked to do this, I wasn't sure what an inaugural lecture was or what it was meant to be. I don't remember ever coming across them when I was at Glasgow, Reading or Leeds universities. And since I joined UEA in 2012, I've seen a handful, and some of them are in the room tonight, um, but each was very different in terms of the content, the style, the delivery, the audience. So I was still unsure. And when I feel unsure, when that happens, my instinct and all my training is to turn to the words. So when you think about what inaugural means... According to the Oxford English Dictionary, it marks the beginning of an institution activity or period of office. So you get things like inaugural concerts, inaugural speeches. And you can see why from the etymology. It comes from the French, inaugurer, inaugure, via the Latin, sorry, to, it comes from the Latin via the French, from the Latin augurere, to take omens. An auger was a priest and official in classical Roman times. The inauguratio was a ceremony or a rite performed by the augers where they observed certain augural signs, the auspices, which marked the god's pleasure at the appointment of a subject to the office in question. In modern English... Inaugural seems to be used particularly in relation to another group of men, US presidents. <laughs> and the examples of texts we find in corpora of English language, which is naturally incurring language from a range of sources, aren't all that encouraging. So I wondered if I went to the French roots of the word, if that might be helpful. And when you look up inaugure or a, a, an inaugural lesson or lecture in French, it takes you right to a very prestigious institution, the Collège de France, where once you're chosen to be a member, you give an inaugural lecture 
which does quite a lot of things, a lot to pack into 45 minutes. So it acknowledges the history of your discipline, the research that's been done already. It situates your own work in relation to that work. And it says what you want to do in future. It introduces everyone to the research programme you plan to carry out. So that felt quite ambitious, but it did point to summing up what you work on and what you plan to work on and how that fits in with what others have done before you, because no, no academic, no researcher works in a vacuum. So that, I felt that was quite helpful. But when I looked at the words and I learned about the examples, it helped me to put my finger on another reason why I was feeling uneasy or un unsure about doing this inaugural. I'm very glad and grateful to be here, particularly to Lee Marsden, who's, I can't see behind the screen, who encouraged me to apply and helped me through the process. And I'm really grateful to my friends and family who put up with me while I did it. But I can't help thinking of others. I can't help thinking of those who are missing. For instance, I'm thinking about all the women who taught me and inspired me when I went to Glasgow University as a modern languages undergraduate. There was no female professor of languages between the university's founding in 1451 and when I left nearly 550 years later, more than half a millennium. University's original purpose was to provide officials for the church and the state. Women didn't figure. We weren't allowed to enrol as students in Scotland until 1892. And even finding any of this out was a challenge, even for a researcher. You have to really dig. It's understandable universities don't particularly want to stress the less positive aspects of their histories. We tend to emphasise the positive, the achievements. So I'm really glad to be here today. But I'm also sad beyond words about all the absent women before me and still today. And not just women, but so many others who either don't fit the original restricted professorial mould, or more and more are employed on insecure, early paid, or temporary contracts. At least 49% of academic staff in the UK, according to the latest Higher Education Statistics Agency figures. So I've been thinking a lot preparing for this lecture about what we've all lost and what we're still losing out on. But I also have been thinking of this. Those of us who arrive in an academy that wasn't shaped by or for us bring knowledges as well as worlds that otherwise wouldn't be here. I've been thinking how we learn about worlds when they don't accommodate us, of the kinds of experiences we all have when we're not expected to be somewhere. And these experiences are a resource to generate knowledge. One of the many things I really like about Ahmed's framing of long-standing losses and absences is how she generously emphasises the riches awaiting us once we open the door to new voices and perspectives. And this is familiar ground for me. Loss is a central theme in translation studies, but so are promises of untold riches available to us once we start to build bridges across to and from other languages. It's hard to do this, it's hard to translate. Imagine we wanted to translate just the two words at the start of my title, just translate into another language. This is probably one of the most common phrases heard by translators and interpreters. Just translate it. I just want you to translate it. Don't worry, it's not difficult. This is usually nuclear <laughs> scientists talking to you. Or as Sedat Mulayam puts it, the unrealistic nature of a typical request often heard from the monolingual speaker. Just tell me what he or she says. So why might this be tricky? Why might it be tricky to translate the words just translate into another language? Well, first, to render this phrase in many languages, 
You'd need to know the gender, the age, the qualifications and the comparative social status of your interlocutor or speaker or reader. Should you use a formal or an informal register? Is it okay to use a command or should it be a request? Are you addressing one person or more than one person? All these things could affect the verb, the voice, the mood, the terms you need to use. Then we come on to the word translate and its sense. So in English, translate's a really useful word, especially in translation studies. It means translating text, so things like subtitles or software programs or books. But it can also encompass other kinds of translation, spoken translation or sign translation, which we usually call interpreting, but which can be part of the global translation word in English. So we have that option and that ambiguity in English, but that's not there in a lot of languages. In a lot of languages, if you say translate, you mean you're not including sign languages, you're not including spoken words, you're only including the text. So you're limiting or restricting by choosing one of the terms. And the word just is even trickier. It's always the small words that are hard for translators. Because it's a play on words. In English, it conveys the sense only, only translate or only translation, but it also conveys allusions to justice and fairness and to rightness or fittingness or appropriateness. So what do you do if there's no term in the language you're translating into, your target language, which encapsulates these different meanings? You might omit one of the meanings. You might add another term, making the title longer to cover both translation and interpreting. You might swap just translate for another phrase, which communi communicates some of the ambiguity, but changes the meaning. And what about languages that use signs instead of words? Sign languages aren't just manual versions of spoken or written languages. British Sign Language isn't a signed version of English. English is just as unintelligible to a BSL user as BSL is to English speakers. Words don't always correspond to signs, first of all, but sign languages also rely on different grammatical frameworks, ways of structuring language. So just translating is rarely an option, and this example is only two simple words. This difficulty means that translation isn't just a transaction. Translation involves thinking seriously about quality, justice and rights. Questions like, who gets translated? Who gets access to translation? Who gets access to good quality translation? And who decides? Who provides? Who pays? These are all hard questions. And that's why I got interested in studying translation and interpreting as well as doing it. You can't just translate, and you can't think about translation in isolation. You can't think about it in isolation from other languages and cultures, from content, from setting, from context, from the interlocutors, the readers, the users who are embodied. They're gendered, they might be deaf, they're different from the clients and commissioners who often aren't the users, the people paying, the people deciding to do the work, to commission the work, often aren't the people who need to use it. And more broadly, from the social and political aspects of provision. So a lot of the questions I was asking myself as I translated were linked to translation quality, and that was the first big theme that I focused on in my research. How can we judge a translation as readers when we don't speak one of the languages? How can you be sure that the 70 versions of your product documentation that you're having translated to sell around the world are of equal quality or of acceptable quality? How can you know that your interpreter isn't an untrained bilingual earning less than the minimum wage and is accurately and effectively relaying the details of your grounds for claiming asylum to the immigration official who has the power to stop you being deported 
if you don't understand what they're saying. Translation and interpreting involve asymmetric information and power imbalances. The user and buyer of the service can't easily judge its quality. And this has been one of the big themes I've worked on over the past two decades, from the UN and the EU down to individual freelance translators working in their spare bedrooms. And this study of translation quality and practice of translation have convinced me to consider the difficult questions translation raises as questions of human rights. I want to argue today that language is a litmus test of our values as a society. And therefore, it can also serve as one of the canaries in the coal mine, the political coal mine, an early symptom of something going wrong, warning us in darkening times of dangers ahead for all of us. Because language is one of the key things that makes us human. Language rights ripple outwards and touch us all, monolinguals included. If a mother-to-be can't understand or communicate with medical professionals, it obviously affects her child too, but it also affects the other parent, the members of the wider family, the healthcare workers, and ultimately the community in which the family lives. If she doesn't get important health messages about vaccination or recovery from surgery, that has an impact. Human beings are connected to each other. And at this point, it's probably important to talk about costs of translation. <coughs> Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez, in a study of translation and language in the UK, recognises that in as much as there is a multilingual society, there will be a bill to pay, there will be costs attached to that. But this isn't as simple as the tabloid headlines suggest. The linguists Gazola and Grand identify three types of costs. Primary, so that's what we pay for translation. Secondary, so those are things like possible misunderstandings or delays or errors. Reduced productivity stemming from a lack of language skills. And thirdly, implicit costs. So those are things like time and money spent learning languages or translating for family members, perhaps being taken out of school to translate for a parent, and so on. So if we don't fund translation, the costs don't go away. The costs of multilingualism don't go away. They're just paid by others, often some of the most vulnerable. And then the costs can be far higher. Secondary costs don't sound too bad, but when we think what they mean... I hope you can see that they're of a different order. So, for instance, in 2000, eight-year-old Victoria Clambier was murdered in London by her caregivers, her guardians. And the following public inquiry, led by Lord Lamming, found that social workers, doctors, the police, local churches and the NSPCC, all of whom had met her, had all missed chances to help her because her abuser translated for her. Rather than pay for a translator at any point, they used the aunt who was abusing her to convey her words. And it's not just those who don't speak the majority language in a country. Putting up walls doesn't work either. The official inquiry of the events, or into the events of 9-11, for example, found that the National Security Agency in America had received warnings of the attacks the day before but they failed to translate and forward them to anyone who could act on them. <coughs> if we deny translation or provide poor quality interpreting to someone accused of a crime, there are clear implications for the rights of the accused and for justice, but we also risk everyone's safety, rights and ability to flourish. A simple reason is because the criminals responsible might not be caught and brought to justice. But an important broader reason is that justice and human rights only make sense as concepts, only make us all safer if they're universal or at least aspire to be. 
Do we want to live in a society where our taxes are potentially paying the costs of prosecuting, imprisoning the innocent because we weren't prepared to pay far, far lower sums for translation when it mattered? This one I read just yesterday while I was preparing for this lecture. So in America today, two-year-old children who don't speak English are in court without interpreters, with volunteers from the Catholic Church, who assume they probably speak Spanish. Many of the children come from Central and Latin America, where they speak indigenous languages and don't speak Spanish or English, but they're also severely traumatised, a two-year-old in court. The cost of translation is another hard question, but it matters. If we decide we won't pay, we have to acknowledge the seriousness of the potential consequences for the, who we are as a society, not just for those we're not paying for, as human beings. Language rights might not yet apply to all humans, but they function in a way that François Julien has described as universalizing. They can help us work towards the emergence of the universal. And even if human rights never get there, it's still important that the universal is underway, on the way to being realised. I believe that translation can make an important contribution to this forward-looking universalising of rights. And I hope that some examples will show why. I'm going to start by taking you back to one of humanity's bleakest moments, the Second World War, when we had the very start of simultaneous interpreting. Simultaneous interpreting started at the Nuremberg trials at the end of the war, the International Military Tribunal, set up by the Allies to try accused Nazi war criminals. Before the Nuremberg trials, interpreting was done consecutively, and it still is today in many settings. So you talked first, then the interpreter who had been listening conveyed what you were saying in the other language. Your interlocutor spoke, the interpreter conveyed back to you. But the tribunal's mission was to ensure fair and expeditious trials of the accused across the four languages needed, English, French, German and Russian. So a foreign language expert for the US Army, a Franco-American, Colonel Léon Doster, came up with a possible solution. He believed for the first time that human beings might be able to listen to one language and speak in another simultaneously. And working with IBM, they came up with a system of microphones and headsets to transmit the four languages that they needed and practice with some interpreters who'd never done this before. And the system did work, apart from a few people apparently tripping over cords in the courtroom, according to the interpreting historian Francesca Gaiba. So I want to stress that even at the end of a world war, even with rationing everywhere, even with devastated cities, before we had an NHS, the cost of doing this wasn't seen as a reason not to try. Providing a fair, transparent trial to people who had deliberately dehumanised others other human beings, who themselves had no regard for human rights, was important precisely to affirm different values. It was a public demonstration of the belief that being human confers rights. And I think we can find evidence for Julian's argument that rights are universalising in the history of language and rights in the UK since the end of the Second World War. And before I go any further, I want to say what I mean by language rights because they're notoriously tricky to define. And it's often hard to unpick where translation and rights to language and rights to translation sit in the debate. Some people draw a distinction between positive and negative language rights. So positive rights are the rights to do something, the right to use your own language individually or collectively. And that's not always a given. In Scotland, Gaelic was banned. People weren't allowed to speak the language in certain public settings. Negative rights would be the right to be free of harm 
due to your language. For instance, not facing discrimination based on your language. Not being attacked or harassed because you speak your, to your child in your shared mother tongue. Something that we know is increasingly happening in public spaces in the UK since Brexit. Others define language rights by listing the various rights that ought to be included using examples. And I think that's a, a practical and helpful and clear way to do it. So I'm going to do that slightly in relation to the UK. There are lots of rights, but I'll, I'll take you through the main ones. In the UK, with some differences in Wales and Scotland, the main relevant legislation lies in the Human Rights Act 1998 and the Equality Act 2010. Although language and translation aren't recognised as human rights as such, specifically under the standard definitions, in the UK protections are included under broader rights such as the right to have and express your own opinions, the right to an education, the right to a private and family life, and the right not to be mistreated or wrongly punished by the state. And this is the relevant um, extract in relation to criminal settings. So everyone charged with a criminal offence has the following minimum rights to be informed promptly in a language that he understands and in detail of the nature and cause of the accusation against him, to have the free assistance of an interpreter, that means the state pays, if he can't understand or speak the language used in court. So in other words, you have a right to understand what is happening in the criminal proceedings when you could be imprisoned. Supranationally, the EU and the UN have supported some language rights and policies, and there are international laws relating to language rights, but most of them are handled at the level of individual states. And particularly in relation to criminal proceedings, there are explicit rights around translation under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Some of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act transposes into national law some directives from the European Parliament, particularly the one from 2010, which for the first time enabled all EU citizens to have free interpretation and translation in criminal proceedings if they're accused of a crime in any EU member state. So at the moment, if you're accused of a road traffic offence in Portugal, someone paid for by the Portuguese government will help you understand what you're accused of understand the proceedings against you, and if you want to challenge them, help you do that. Deaf people have additional rights across all settings under the Equality Act 2010. So it's up to us to make reasonable adjustments to ensure that disabled clients, employees or managers aren't placed at substantial disadvantage compared to those who aren't disabled. And the costs, again, have to be borne by whoever's providing the service. It shouldn't be the deaf person who always has to pay for the interpreter. I'm going to explain a bit now about what these rights can mean in practice for communication in our increasingly multilingual societies by taking you through an illustration from my own work. So one problem with language rights sitting at multiple levels is that there are differing interpretations of what the rights mean in different settings and by different gatekeepers. Often the person who makes the decision about whether an interpreter should be booked or how much they're willing to pay has a lot of power in this situation. And that's not clearly laid out in the law. So this means that experiences and outcomes are very different across the country. If you're accused of a crime in Cornwall, you might be treated very differently in relation to your language than if you're accused of exactly the same crime in Manchester. <coughs> My most recent project has been with the Home Office, the police and their trainers in the UK and Belgium. Until this year, there's been no training for police officers working across languages, nor for immigration officers in the Home Office in how to work effectively with interpreters and translators. So we've brought in some new training and guidance and from about three months' time, that will be rolled out nationally in future. Um, and what we've been doing is testing it and seeing if it works, finding out what the investigators or the officials need to know, finding out what the interpreters think they need to know, which is quite different often, and then trying to make sure that the guidance is as good as it can be and that the training's as good as it can be. And doing this research has meant interviewing hundreds of those on the front line, and it's brought out some emerging and challenging kinds of linguistic cooperation. 
So I'm going to take you through a scenario faced by interpreters, quite a few of whom we've spoken to. Um, and when you're phoned as an interpreter and asked to take on a booking, typically you're phoned by an agency or by a police officer if it's a booking officer in custody, and you'll be given a few details about the job type, and then you're told where to go and roughly how long they think it will last. Perhaps you're given a few details. You might be given the name of the individual for whom you're going to translate or interpret. Um, but that, that would be a typical assignment. But in our research, we found that there were new kinds of assignment increasingly happening. So I'd like you to imagine you're the interpreter now, and the phone's just rung, and you pick it up, it's your usual agency. And they say, could you make yourself available for up to 48 hours in four days' time, consecutively? They can't give you any further details, You'll be picked up at your home address in an unmarked car and you should bring a change of clothes and a toothbrush. You won't be able to communicate with anyone for the 48 hours and don't bring a mobile or laptop. Do you think you would take the job? <laughs> and if you did, how would you prepare for it? So this kind of job is happening increasingly where there are raids happening on large-scale operations, typically around human trafficking. So if the police investigation is showing that an address seems to be being, be, being used by traffickers, there will be observations for some time and they'll decide that they're going to do a raid. And it's obviously critical that it's kept secret because if you're going to do a raid and it gets out into the community where a language is spoken, it's going to be pretty obvious to, the, or the, the, the risk is it's going to get through to the people who you're going to be raiding. So that's why secrecy is needed. And typically the interpreters are expected to go along on the raid because the police can't c communicate with the people there. Something that's quite important to think about is that the police monitoring of the address will have led them to believe that a certain language or a group of languages are spoken there. But they might be wrong. So often they'll go along with an interpreter for Lithuanian and find out it's actually another language that people need to speak. But they might sometimes take two or three interpreters. Sometimes they get it right. It's a, it's a tricky one. So the interpreters go along with the police and they're raiding. It's typically in the very early hours of the morning. So people are asleep. And they're picking up human trafficking suspects, but also victims and witnesses. Many of them will be highly vulnerable and traumatised individuals, obviously, sometimes including children. They may be dirty, hungry, injured, suffering from serious diseases. They may not have spoken to anyone apart from the traffickers for some time. And a raid is terrifying, even if you aren't one of those people. Once the raid happens, and the interpreters are there to shout out the messages, the key messages from the police, in whichever language they've been booked for, they are then taken to a Red Cross organised reception centre. These are usually in remote rural, rural, I hate that word, remote rural locations. So they'll hire somewhere in the middle of the countryside um, because secrecy and security are needed and it needs to be somewhere big. And at that point, the clock is ticking. Under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, you have to charge people within a certain number of hours. And you can get a small number of extensions, but it's not straightforward and it's not automatic. So very quickly, the police have to figure out who they need to interview and what kind of order they should be doing the interviews in and the interpreters are needed for each of those interviews. So the interpreters are likely to be ricocheting around the victims, the witnesses, the suspects and doing intensive interviews. Even where the rights to translation are clear cut in law then, delivery in practice can be impossible. Finding enough qualified and experienced linguists prepared to do this work is a challenge, not least because in the UK the government has an outsourcing policy. That means that the contracts for inter translation and interpreting aren't held any longer by local police forces. They're, they're held by four or five big agencies across the UK who have to make a profit. So the government is paying less than it was for translation and interpreting, and more of what they're paying is going to a middleman, an agency, rather than to the linguists. And as you can imagine, that means that people are leaving in droves to do work in the commercial sector or other sectors. How do you arrange a suitable interpreter for a person of interest to your inquiry who speaks a rare language? 
What about someone who's literate, traumatised and terrified of the police? These are really difficult challenges. And what about different levels of quality in these settings? There are significant issues around equal access to justice when there just aren't any trained providers available from many of the world's languages. And these issues aren't going to go away. What has been called the dark underbelly of globalisation, transnational organised crime, isn't going to go away. Transnational organised crime increasingly requires us to cooperate across languages and to understand a broader range of languages. If you look at the main global transnational organised crime flows, so this is already out of date, it's about eight years ago from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, you can see just how multilingual transnational organised crime is. There are trade in, in items that I'd never even heard of until I, until I started working in this area. Cassiterite, I'm not even sure I pronounced that one right still. Um, smuggling of migrants, firearms, counterfeit goods, counterfeit medicines. And understanding these crimes and tracking them and impeding them demands multilingual cooperation. It's not just about crime though. Migration and multilingualism are normal. They have been the norm throughout human history and around the globe. So last year, linguists, academics, translators and others met in Salzburg to focus on this idea of a multilingual world. And some of the figures I think are important. It's normal to be multilingual. We often forget that in England, but it's the norm. Another thing that's important is that increasingly languages are endangered. So of the 7,000 odd languages, about a third are endangered or dying. Only 23 languages dominate and they're spoken by over a half of the world's population. But I think that's actually quite interesting that over a half don't speak one of the 23 most spoken languages. And when you look at the bottom line, 244 million people, this was back in 2017, are international migrants, 20 million refugees. Migrants and refugees alone would constitute the fifth most populous country in the world. So recently there's been increased attention to the idea of linguistic diversity as akin to biodiversity, a kind of global human wealth that's under threat. It's under threat because there are political risks, totalitarianism growing, worrying developments internationally, Brexit perhaps. And I think it's important at the moment to pay attention to what happens with language, what's said about language. There are technological risks, just like in other sectors, the growth of artificial intelligence and the speed of that growth our risks, our threats for language. Language and translation have always been seen as key challenges for AI. So that's why they've invested so much time and focus and energy on trying to solve the translation problem. And the most recent iteration of um, the response to that problem is to use neural networks which learn how to use languages and learn how to translate, but we don't know how they do that. We don't know how they learn the language and we don't know how they learn to translate. And that means that AI, that neural machine translation, gets it wrong in ways that are impossible to predict and really hard to spot. The old versions of Google Translate were pretty easy to look at and figure out what the mistake was. But increasingly now, neural machine translation produces output that seems plausible. The style will be fine. But it might not be a translation at all. It might be saying something totally different to the source text. And if you think back to the idea that translation is an asymmetrical kind of information, in other words, you can't tell whether the translation is good or not if you're commissioning it, that's a worry, that's a concern. What would a world where machines do our translating mean for international cooperation, for example? What would it mean for humans? 
I think we're at an important moment where we should pay careful attention to language and how rights are framed and discussed. It matters. The challenges we face in the coming decades mean we need to be able to hear wise voices, no matter what languages they're speaking, both in universities and beyond. We all stand to benefit if we listen to new voices, the untold riches we've been missing out on in our monolingual silos. But the riches aren't just lying out there already in other languages waiting to be translated. It's the act of translating itself that involves making new knowledge in what have been called inevitable moments of friction and hesitation. The social geographers Crane, Lombard and Tents believe that it's particularly in these moments when we pause to think about interpreting, when we pause to reword or make sure understanding is happening, that thinking is challenged by new ideas and thoughts. It's in these little breaks that things move forward in constructive ways, that we create hybrid spaces. These ruptures in knowledge have the potential to open up new horizons, to create greater understanding. And this has been my experience of working in translation, but also of being an academic in institutions designed without my kind, designed deliberately to exclude my kind. And that's where I take hope at the moment. New voices, new insights and new knowledge have been able to make inroads, despite the great obstacles. And we can see how the move to define and recognise human rights gained a momentum and became universalising in ways which weren't the original intent. So I'd like to finish with some ideas from linguists on how we might move to collective action on language rights too, in case anyone would like to join in. So the Salzburg linguists came up with some ideas for things we might do. And I think they bring to mind for me some of the points that Sarah Ahmed made as well in relation to women's place in universities. They focus on the positive. There are positive features of multilingualism, benefits to be had. We can all do something to actively support language rights, to support diversity. We can tackle instances of discrimination, prejudice, bias and inequality associated with language if we w witness them. And we can recognise that minorities, migrants and refugees possess high linguistic capital that might be of great value for our present and future world. And if you'd like to do something practical locally, there are a host of initiatives right here in Norwich, including at UEA. So we've got a UEA sanctuary scholarship for asylum seekers who aren't eligible for other kinds of financial support. Three, I think, next year. There are great organisations locally which help refugees and asylum seekers to learn English or to use their linguistic skills in different ways. Some of our students work with the Norwich Integration Partnership, with Bridge Plus, with English Plus, and other organisations to make a difference. And even on a very small level, tonight we've arranged for a representative of one Norwich City of Sanctuary to collect on the door. So if anyone's got 50p spare in their pockets, feel free to make a contribution. Claire is somewhere <coughs> in the audience. And she's also brought along a list. If anybody would like to sign up and find out more about what Norwich City of Sanctuary does, then I've uh, just seen her. She, she'll be at the door collecting and you can sign up. That was what I was going to say, wasn't it, about signing up to get more information. So if anyone feels able to contribute to their really important work, they and I would be very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. That was absolutely um, tr tremendous. And I think you've got a flavour there, really, of uh, just um, how important the work that Jo um, is doing within the school and with her own, uh, within her, her research. Um, really is a very, very proud moment as a head of school when uh, one of our colleagues um, does their inaugural lecture. And I think you've got a real taste of that 
today. I mean, he's beginning to talk about the importance of, uh, of translation, but not just the importance, the necessity of, uh, of, uh, of translation as a, a human rights issue. Talked about women in the um, academy and those sort of absent women. And uh, I think over generations we've, we, we've noticed, uh, noticed that and it, it sort of re- regretted that. And things hopefully are beginning to, to change. What we can celebrate tonight is that we have a very special woman in the academy and uh, her contribution is uh, really important both within the school but I think also within wider society as well. Joe is somebody who will always speak truth to power and I think that really is very, very important indeed. Um, she talked about um, the rights to translation and interpreting and it costs money. And I just love that uh, slide of Katie Hopkins uh, lamenting this. Well, here in the room we have the antidote to Katie Hopkins, and it's, uh, it's Joe Drugan. Um, my wife is a probation officer and often talks to me about how um, the people that she um, deals with, many from different, uh, from different nationalities, the problems and the difficulties which they have in terms of translation and the quality of the translators and whether they collude with the, uh, with the person under, um, uh, who's uh, been, been accused... Um, or whether they collude with other um, sides, whether they're actually given a faith or representation. And Jo talked about what she's actually doing in terms of her, her research. We t- call them, in the jargon, sort of impact case studies. And impact case studies really have to make a difference in terms of uh, people's lived experience and how it influences policy. And I think she really has an absolutely crucial role to to play. Her work is very, very practical and actually making a real difference to real people's lives. And we'd be um, significantly impoverished um, if she wasn't doing this work. Um, I think she's given us a great insight. I'll just take... Well, she talks about uh, 7,097 languages currently being spoken in the world today. I think within the school we offer about 11... Uh, languages that we can uh, offer to people to, to learn, which is great because this is a growth industry. We have another 7,000 and uh, 80 uh, <laughs> one we could, we could be offering. Um, but she and with optimism. I mentioned that she is somebody who is very practical and wants to make a real difference in her research. You think, well, you know, it's a big issue. How on earth do we do that? But she's given us a very practical demonstration right at the end in terms of how we can actually make a a difference here in Norwich and help to make and shape um, a better world. And uh, we're grateful to you for that, Jo. It's my great honour to uh, propose this uh, vote of thanks um, to Jo and then to open things up for for discussion. Um, We have about 10 minutes or so of of question and answer and then there's an opportunity to uh, talk some more and uh, importantly to drink some wine or some uh, soft drink um, as well and chat some more with people. But uh, we invite your questions, but uh, could we perhaps have a, a round of applause for, for Joe and then we we'll start the talk. for questions so we've been asked to repeat the questions so I'm not being patronising if you say your question I'll say it back to you but um, let's, let's put the film at the back the film. does anyone have a question? I know at the EU because they use so many different languages and English is really only spoken by three of the countries as of NATO they ask people to draft documents in this kind of a simplified English or non-colloquial with no national uh, Subscript in it. How, how does it work in, in, in the world of translation, particularly working with uh, immigrants? Are officers uh, instructed not to use words that are difficult to convey in a different culture? Well, there's quite a lot packed in there. Yeah, um, so there are, there are various things that um, we can do. So officers are trained in speaking carefully to a range of different interlocutors, in English anyway, they often speak to people 
whose reading age might be very low, who might have very restricted vocabularies, um, or who might speak very, in, in very different ways. So officers are typically very used to speaking clearly, um, and they can do that in English. Um, but they also have to be quite inventive. I, I never know how many stories to tell about the, the work we've been doing. But um, one of the examples that the police officers gave us was when they were interviewing a child. Um, and the, the child used a very rude term to describe his brother, because that's what he was called in the family. And so the police officers referring to the brother in the interview just had to keep calling him that little, I won't say the word, um, and they just have to be flexible, and, and they do. They realise that that's how they work. So they, they're more than competent to speak clearly in English and to, to communicate um, effectively. They're trained in doing that. And the interpreters can, can work with the police officers effectively to do that where they have the chance to. But often one of the challenges that um, is faced is around the experience and qualifications of the linguists. So translating and interpreting are unregulated professions in the UK. Anyone can call themselves a translator or interpreter. Um, and in the past, that they wouldn't have been able to work in police stations. There's a national register of public service interpreters, and the police would source their interpreters from there. There might be exceptions where there's a rare language and they couldn't find someone qualified, but there was a kind of quality, basic quality guarantee, and these people were trained to work in police contexts and had knowledge of police procedures and so on. But since the outsourcing and framework contracts, um, we've seen things recently like police stations putting out calls on Twitter saying, does anyone speak Lithuanian and can get to this area in the next 20 minutes. Um, so there, there are quite worrying things happening on the linguist side at the moment. Coming back to the EU, um, they do use a, a controlled form of English. That's common in other settings too. Caterpillar was one of the first to come up with this idea of controlled English. <clears throat> So there's a restricted phrase book, and you have to choose your terms from there. And the reason for that is to make translation easier. It means that some translation can be done effectively by machines, but it also means that humans can do translation faster. It's more consistent. You're not doing things like using cricket metaphors, which don't work in most of the world. Um, you, you, you know, even Scotland. Um, so you, you're thinking about communicating effectively and clearly, um, and those, those things do work. Um, other things the EU have done to try and manage the, the challenges and the costs of a multilingual organisation is to bring in a translation um, rationing policy. So you're only allowed to send documents of up to three pages for translation. And if you want to send any more than that, then you have to get a really sort of high level authorisation to do that now. And that's cut down on a lot of the costs. A lot of the commissioners used to just get massive documents translated because there was a translation service and they thought it might be needed. Now they tend to think, well, who's going to need this translation into this particular language? Um, and they're fairly careful about how they use the resources and try to use them wisely. Internally in meetings, they only use three languages, English, French and German. So the minute takers can actually manage, because if you can think about it, taking minutes across 24 languages wouldn't be very simple. I don't think anyone could do that. So that they, ha they have working methods which get around some of the challenges too. We've got time for that. Yes, we've got time for the question. With the outsourcing of like, linguists to the private sector, is there a current government solution to the decline in like language services, or would you just say that the solution would be to go back to her? Uh, that's the, the, the question. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, um, is outsourcing in the UK because of a decline in language services or is it government policy to, to work that way? Is that, that's reframing it? Yeah. Um, so, and it, will they ever go back to employing linguists in-house? So it, they never actually were employed in-house. There were very, there are a few in the Met, but there were very, very few police linguists who actually worked permanently for the police. Because it's very variable. One day they'll need, you know, 100 translators for a language and then they might not need any in that language for another six months. And they might be all over the country. You know, sometimes they'll need Vietnamese translators suddenly, interpreters suddenly in Dundee. But the next day it might be in Cornwall. And that, you know, that, that, that's difficult. Especially when the clock's ticking on making and charging someone. So it makes sense. And most linguists are freelance. They work in the private sector. They work for themselves as independent workers. Um, and that's always been the way it's been organised. But they had a direct relationship with our client before, and that's what's gone now. 
Um, and within the police um, setting, there are certainly conversations being had about whether this is the wisest use of the public funds, about whether it's working and what could be done better. Um, that's certainly something that they're aware of. I don't think I can say any more than that. Um, but these policy decisions often aren't made by the users or the commissioners of translations and interpreting. They're often made by government or they're made in different, um, at different levels of administration where the challenges might not be so clearly apparent. So it's a, it's a difficult one. And time for just one final, final question. Just the role that you mentioned, um, training for the officers includes sign language. Does the rollout include sign language? Yeah. So what we've done is we've co we have to work the way the police work. And the way the police work is they come up with a document called an authorised professional practice. So the APP um, has been written in consultation with professional associations, including British Sign Language Interpretation um, organisations, Noobsley, and we worked with Deaf Connections here in Norwich. Um, and they tested out our, our sign language content. It's currently out for final consultation, the document. We had a final con conference a couple of weeks ago, um, and that will then be rolled out. And there, there's substantial information in there about how to work across sign languages too. So, yeah, if you, if you know about those things and you'd like to feed in, we'd be very happy to hear your, your views. Please do get in touch. Great. Lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Drogan.